So maybe while people are joining, let's just go around and introduce ourselves. I'll uh, just call out people's names as I've got on my screen. So starting with Neil, who's tapping madly away on his keyboard. <laughs> Sorry, Tom, should have muted. Um, right. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Neil Cowie. I'm an English teacher based in uh, um, Okayama University uh, in Japan. Uh, I did the CMOL last year and um, I found it really interesting and stimulating thing to do. So I'm very glad to do it again. Nice to meet you. So Neil's been one of our regulars uh, and he's also part of our Asklite Mobile Learning Special Interest Group. So great to have Neil on board. Um, and I suppose I should introduce myself. I'm Thomas Cochran. I'm part of the Melbourne Centre for the Study of Higher Education and uh, working remotely from New Zealand at this point. Um, been been uh, part of the team there since April this year. Um, so I'll be one of the facilitators um, as we go along over the next seven weeks and uh, creating this community and, and a bit of a support network. So next on my screen, I've got Chris Deneen. Hi, I'm Chris, and I'm also with the Melbourne Centre for the Study of Higher Education, and I've been there about a year and a half. And um, my background is teacher education, but I became very interested in uh, learning technology pretty early on. And that's been a consistent thread for my research, my development, and also my practice in the future. So I look forward to the CMALT process. Cool, thanks Chris. Uh, David, David Heath. Uh, good morning, I'm an associate professor at a university in Yokohama called Kanto Gakuin, and my field is translation studies. And I was prompted to get into this field uh, by the pandemic. I imagine I'm not alone in that. So hi. Yeah, I imagine so. Great to have a, at least two people from Japan uh, joining us, which is fantastic. Lisa. Hi everyone, I'm Lisa from Auckland University of Technology in Auckland, New Zealand. Um, we're hoping to come in out of a, a level of pandemic very shortly. Um, I work for the Learning Technology team. I have completed my CMALT. However, um, I've got some modifications to make. Um, so I'm hoping that I might pick up some bits and pieces from people during this time um, to help me finish these modifications. Thank you, Lisa. Now, I think your uh, microphone's catching on your collar or something. It's making a little bit of a noise there. Sorry about that. That's all right. Um, Jalal. Sorry, Kira. Uh, just had to unmute myself. I'm Jalal. I'm also with the Auckland University of Technology. Um, I've been using um, technology in my teaching for close to a decade now in a previous university and now at um, AUT. Um, and I love it. So um, I'm hoping to learn more um, from you guys as we progress through this um, um, seem, uh, MOOC. Sorry. Um, that's about it. <laughs> Great. Great to have you on board, Jalal. Next on my screen, I've got Bronwyn Dusseldorf. Hello, I'm from the University of Melbourne. I work as a um, learning and teaching consultant in learning environments, helping everyone get the best out of whichever learning technology systems we have at the moment. And this year it's been a flood. And my background is in teacher education. And I'm really looking forward to um, hearing all the stories and interacting with you. Thank you. Great. Julie, Julie Lindsay. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm at the University of Southern Queensland in a new position, Associate Director of Digital Learning Innovation. And uh, my team, we're all coming back onto campus this week, though I've been here for four weeks. I've recently jumped across the Queensland border a month ago and uh, became a Queenslander. And uh, look, I've finished my PhD last year and I'm just looking to engage in the wider community. I've been in educational technology for 30 years, mostly K-12 the last days in higher education. Thank you. Great to have you on board. Kef. Okay, so I'm Kath Kohn. Um, I'm at Auckland University of Technology in public health um, uh, in the South Campus there. And um, I've learned a lot from Tom and uh, um, others who are using uh, um, online uh, teaching. But I feel like I've got a long way to go. And um, I've got a 
couple of new courses, so it would be great to move those from the online space a little bit more successfully. Cool. And uh, looks like also sharing the same space as you, we have Mo. Hi, I'm Phil Moss. Mo is my tag. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, I'm actually a secondary school teacher with a real interest in digital learning techniques and technologies, um, which I've incorporated into my teaching for about the past five years. And part of the journey for me is the, the connection between secondary schools and higher level. So how can maybe things become a bit more seamless in a digital sense between what we do in high school and what you guys do in the academic streams, et cetera. Yeah, I think that's really important connection. Great to have you on board. Stuart Barber. Uh, hi, so my name is uh, Stuart. I'm a lecturer in the Melbourne Veterinary School at University of Melbourne. So I'm one, one of the people who goes and annoys Bromman for help on a regular <laughs> basis. Um, so look, I guess my, my background is in building virtual reality environments and using a range of other educational technologies in helping our students access to places they wouldn't be able to otherwise. Um, so that, that's my main background. Great. And uh, next on my screen, I've got Michael Cowling. Sorry, just looking for the mute button. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm Michael Cowling. I'm an associate professor at Central Queensland University. So, um, and uh, I was feeling like a bit of the old one out here. Everyone is learning technologists. And then Stuart came along, and he's a technologist just like me. And I, I spend some time working in virtual and augmented reality as well and looking at how that technology can help uh, students um, and I'm really interested in CMALT as, a, as an accreditation experience and to find out a little bit more and to, uh, to reflect a little bit. I'm looking forward to these sessions. Great to have you on board Michael. And Michael's also on the uh, Escalite um, executive. Um, Mark, another Escalite executive member, Mark Shire. Good morning everybody. Um, thanks uh, Tom. I tried to do this last year but uh, ran into huge roadblocks and, uh, and workload issues. Um, I'm from Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne and my sort of area is uh, physiology and so I've always been interested in technological ways of uh, translating that to student experiences. And I'm very interested in the CMALT process because uh, I think it's a way as Michael just said, of reflecting on your practice, trying to sort of uh, marshal it all together and um, and present it as a package even to myself. So uh, I'm looking forward to sort of trying to do the accreditation and, and the journey along the way. Great. Thanks, Mark. Susan Mickey. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm with Neil Cowie. I'm at Okayama University. Uh, I'm a lecturer there. Uh, my background is uh, electrical engineering, but life gives you some curves, and uh, now I'm in Japan, and I've always been into training. Uh, so I'm really interested in um, look, learning a lot of things. I've been using technology for so many years in training, so it'd be nice to put everything together, the teaching aspects and the technology aspects, and uh, learn together with everybody. Thank you. Great. So we've got three from Japan. That's cool. Uh, next on my screen, I've got Keith, Keith Higgett. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Keith Higgett. I'm from the University of Technology, Sydney. Um, a new appointment there started uh, this year, lecturing in learning design, which is great fun. And I come from a, a learning design background in a corporate um, and educational setting, and also a high school background as high school uh, teacher and leader in, across Australia and the United Kingdom. Um, you know, so I'm looking forward to being part of the CMALT community. Thanks. Cool. Marion, Marion Mahat. Hi, my name is Marion. I am also from the, the University of Melbourne. Um, I used to work at the Melbourne Centre for the Study of Higher Education, Tom, about six, seven years ago, um, and taught online at the LH Martin Institute. Um, but I'm now at the Melbourne Graduate School of Education and um, and now building turning face-to-face -face subjects into online because of the current pandemic. Um, but I'm also um, developing a series of microsets which begins development next month. And I'm interested to find out how best I can um, include technology into, you know, short courses. Great. Next on my screen, I've got Claire. 
Hi everyone. Um, I also bother Bronwyn a lot and <laughs> and recognise a few people here, Meredith, and I've been in contact with Stuart. I'm a lecturer of oral health at the Melbourne Dental School and have really embraced um, education technology this year to try and keep teaching clinically while we've had to be remote for six months. So I'm excited to meet everyone and see such diversity. It'll be really um, interesting to to learn about some of the processes that you've done to be able to do that remotely, Claire. It's been so much fun. <laughs> fun and probably hard work as well. Um, so I also have another Claire on my screen. Hello, sorry about that other Claire. We'll have to, you'll have to be the young Claire and I'll be the not so young Claire. <laughs> not very young. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so my name is Claire Alderson. I'm a learning designer at the University of Western Australia and um, I've been, uh, well, I've had a number of titles. So at the moment I'm a learning designer, but at one stage I was a, um, I was called a TED. So that was a trainer educational designer. And then I was a learning technologist and now I'm a learning designer. So I've sort of covered a range of roles and I'm looking forward to doing the accreditation just to formalize some of the things that I've actually done and sort of recognize that things are changing at you know, uh, such a pace that it would be nice to actually stop and reflect on what's been done and what can be done in this space. Thanks. Cool. Next on the screen, I've got Teresa, Teresa Stockwell. Um, hello. Uh, sorry for my noisy entrance earlier. When I opened the Zoom on my phone, Neil's face popped up. And so I was foolishly thinking that I was just talking to Neil. So sorry about that. Um, so I'm with Neil and uh, Susan at Okayama University in Japan. And um, I've been hearing from Neil a lot. He's very into the um, using technology in education and he recommended this MOOC and so um, I decided to take it and I'm really looking forward to um, learning a lot from everybody. So nice to be here. Thank you. Great to have you on board, um, Teresa. Um, next on my screen I've got Ingrid, Ingrid D'Souza. Hi everyone, um, I'm from Monash University and I'm currently labelled, if you like, as an education designer in the Faculty of Arts. Um, the reason, I guess, um, for me doing this was twofold. One, I'm currently undertaking a PhD into the um, sort of professional identity of ed designers as a very generic topic. And also I was interested to know how to formalise my own um, journey, I guess. So I thought I'd take this on. Great to have you on board, Ingrid. I'm Meredith. Hi, um, I'm Meredith Hings from the Faculty of Arts at the University of Melbourne. Um, I manage e-learning, e-teaching and a faculty, so manage a little team of ed tech type people. And uh, all of my teaching background actually has involved technology from probably 1994 onwards in various, yeah, iterations. Um, and I guess more recently teaching digital media within the Faculty of Arts in our publishing program. Um, but yeah, I'm professional staff and very much looking forward to learning more about um, it's very similar to what Ingrid just said about uh, ways of formalising my practice and reflecting on it and yeah, how to pull that all together. It's great to see everyone here and yeah, I, I recognise a few people and yeah, really looking forward to getting to know people. Yeah, it's good to have some friends uh, uh, among us already, but uh, looking forward to making a whole lot more friends as well. So uh, talking about uh, people I already know, Tom Worthington. Um, whoops, I'll find the microphone. Um, I'm Tom Worthington. I'm an honorary lecturer in computer science at the Australian National University in Canberra, although I'm in Sydney today opposite a slightly noisy primary school. So I apologise for background noises. Um, this year I'm teaching our computing students how to write a job application just before they graduate. And at the start of the year I had the job to help teach our 70 tutors how to teach, uh, not knowing whether we'd have classrooms or not, which was interesting. I've had a few attempts at CMALT, and I thought maybe one more go, and we'll see how we do. Yeah, I think we'll probably talk about um, process as we go along, but uh, 
certainly it can be can be journey getting your accreditation uh, through and not necessarily straight off the first time. And last on my screen, but not obviously not least, is Samantha. Thank you. Sorry, I um, <laughs> ironically had some <laughs> technical issues <laughs> trying to get in, which is probably not a good start. Um, uh, I work with uh, Claire McNally at the Melbourne Dental School um, and we are currently undergoing a curriculum review and looking at ways that we can use, um, and we, we do use technology now to support our students' learning, but we need to do that more. And I think this would be a good uh, way to sort of collect our practice uh, sort of individually in that, in that place and, um, uh, and see what else is out there to be able to help support our students. Great. Hey, well, welcome everyone. It's great to have you all here and great to have you part of our first uh, catch up via Zoom. I'm a little bit loath to call it a webinar because I really prefer that it'd be more of a discussion and uh, sort of focused on what people want to talk about. But I guess to start with, uh, we need to sort of set a few, um, you know, where we're heading, what's it all about, that sort of thing. So it'll probably be a fair amount of me talking today. But um, if I start getting bored and you start falling asleep, just ask a few questions. Feel free to button along the way because... Uh, I've done this a few times now and I'll probably assume a few things that might not be obvious. So just, yeah, ask questions as we go. And uh, if there's anything that needs clarifying, just make sure you, you do, you know, just turn your microphone and ask. That would be great. So I'm just going to um, go into screen sharing. So Keith had some questions about blogs. Just while I'm screen sharing. Keith, what was your question about the blogs? Okay, I can't type it quick enough to, to answer the to, to answer the question. Just I've got my own blog, um, and and I've been using it, and and I you know chuck up all my thoughts about learning design and all those kinds of things up there. Can I still continue to use that for my CMOP portfolio, or do you recommend that I just start an entirely new WordPress blog? So I guess my thinking would be just make it if you're using WordPress, then it's pretty easy. Um, but most blogging sites allow you to create static pages or you know use a menu item to separate stuff out and so i would I'd recommend that people create a CMOT section of whatever blog or ePortfolio they're using um, so you don't have to recreate a whole new site or new blog just you know create a menu section for your CMOT portfolio where, where you can put it all together and uh, do that as a as a menu structure that follows the uh, the seven core elements of a portfolio. Awesome, thank you. Okay, Marion, did you have a question? Um, yes, sorry. Um, I'm really, really, really new to this and I'm not sure the context. Um, so if you could give a little bit of context for the CMOC, CMOC um, what it's about and you know what it, do, it does, that would be good. Sure. I guess that's kind of where I'm, where I'm heading next. But uh, yep. so to, to try to sort of pull it all together, the one, one stop shop for the hub is the, the WordPress site. So cmocmook.wordpress.com. And that's kind of like the outline, the framework that, uh, that we try to link everything else together. Because we are using quite a variety of online tools to uh, facilitate this uh, community. Um, mainly because there isn't one tool that does everything. And uh, also because it is an international community, we can't do this in, in an LMS because it would just be too difficult to get everyone logins. And so we're using open access tools to be able to do this. So I guess the place to, to look first is uh, our WordPress hub site. I'm just using a free version of WordPress uh, and the domain I've just created there is cmocmook, one word, dot wordpress dot com. And linked off here, you will find various resources. Um, so the home screen is the blog, the blog page, and that's what gets updated. And each week, uh, I'll put a new uh, blog post there about uh, what we're covering that week. And probably as we go through the week as well, there's a few activities that I kind of suggest that people get involved in, partly just to create this community, partly to give people experiences of different um, educational technology if they haven't already. Um, and partly just to give you some ideas around how to perhaps populate your e-portfolio if you're, if you're not quite sure what you could stick in there. Um, 
then the about is just a brief overview of what is this uh, CMOOC, a bit of its background, um, started uh, 2017, and uh, got a little bit of a diagram there, which I haven't updated, so some of it's a little bit redundant, like the Google Plus community um, no longer exists. We now use a Moodle discussion forum for our community forum. And um, this year, I'm also keen to explore using the new WordPress P2 um, discussion forum, which WordPress has only just released. Apparently, it's the way that they uh, work as a remote team around the world themselves. At this point, P2 is a bit of a bare bones uh, offering, but apparently they will be slowly releasing more features and hopefully it actually becomes a useful discussion forum for us to be able to use. Uh, as I've kind of found that Moodle, um, you know, being based on an LMS, it, it doesn't really seem to engender a whole lot of discussion, which is what it's supposed to be for. So as far as the, uh, the tools that we're using, we're using WordPress as a hub. You can see it in the center here. I've asked everyone to create their own ePortfolio uh, and suggested WordPress as a format. You don't have to use WordPress. You could use whatever blog system you like, or you could use Mahara. You could use Google Sites. Um, part of the key there is really just to, that it's online, that it's linkable, and that you can share it if you want to get feedback on it. Um, <clears throat> so really trying to build this as a supporting community uh, around people interested in uh, exploring CMOD accreditation, but not necessarily that is the end game. It's, it's also really just about connecting people, connecting minds, people interested in similar, similar things, which is educational technology and uh, creating an international community around that in the network. And so I guess that's why I framed this around the idea of a CMOOC. Um, as you can see, we don't have thousands of people, which is not the goal. It's, it's about connecting people. And so the key for me is that little C in the MOOC. Uh, it's about connecting, about connecting ideas, about connecting people, about people sharing. So although with the WordPress site, you can see I've broken it up into seven areas and that maps to the seven core areas of a uh, CMOP portfolio, um, Really, there's not a lot of content. So the C doesn't stand for content here. It stands for connecting. And it's about what you as a participant are, share, are willing to share. So, you know, you're not going to get um, marked on doing any particular activities for the CMOOC. Uh, you're not going to get a certificate at the end. Um, the goal is that this will help you to build a CMOOC portfolio for accreditation, which is actually separate to um, the CMOOC itself. It's a, it's a pre-existing accreditation framework. Um, <clears throat> so to be able to communicate across this network, which is, um, as, as you've seen, right around the world, and uh, we've got quite a few people who are currently in bed uh, in the UK, we're using a couple of um, asynchronous technologies. So Twitter, I suggested you use Twitter, and if you haven't signed up for Twitter, then give it a go. Have it, have it you know, sign up and see if it's useful for you. You don't have to continue with it beyond the CMOOC if you don't, if it doesn't uh, work for you. Um, but personally, I find Twitter a really powerful tool to create an international community. And most people who are involved in education, education technology, uh, who use Twitter are very open to sharing. And I find a lot of resources via Twitter. Uh, and you don't have to follow hundreds of people. So the key with Twitter is to search via hashtags. And so we've created the hashtag for the CMOOC, which is, as you can see, relatively consistent, hash CMOOC CMOOC. So by searching for the hashtag on Twitter, you'll find a collection of resources and uh, conversations going on. Um, so we're building community and we're using that via a Moodle discussion forum, via the WordPress P2. And it'll be interesting to see which we get more um, activity on. I'm picking probably P2 is going to be uh, a bit more active than what the Moodle forum has, hopefully. Each week, um, recording these webinars and sharing them on YouTube, YouTube so that people can watch them later. And uh, we've also created the collaborative Google Map, which you would have hopefully had an email invite to become an editor of. Um, your, I guess your own, Profiles are, you know, what you're building up. 
over the seven weeks if you haven't started some of these. A lot of you have probably been involved in educational technology for many, many years, like uh, Julie was talking about, you know, 30 years of experience and what you're effectively doing via this CMOLT uh, portfolio is drawing that all together. And uh, I guess for myself, that's what I found really valuable out of the process was, um, you know, 20, 20, 25 years of experience of, of being involved in educational technology, but just stuff everywhere. <laughs> just, it's just kind of so many different projects, so many different sites, um, so many different tools. Uh, and creating a portfolio was a great way of bringing that all together. And it's kind of a bit like, you know, being an artist. You're not defined by one painting or, or if you're a musician by one song, it's your body of work and how do you bring that all together uh, and into you know, a cohesive unit that tells a story and that's the idea of the portfolio. So hopefully that'll actually be valuable for you beyond uh, just a CMOD accreditation. In fact, you know, the majority of people who've actually been through the CMOOC haven't even uh, gone through the CMOT accreditation process, but hopefully have found the building the community, creating their, pe their pe portfolio, a useful and valuable experience. And certainly from my own experience, uh, it's been very useful for progression, uh, for applying for jobs, being able to have evidence uh, and a, a really you know, solid portfolio that I can use for that. Um, and so trying to build some of those up, and as you can see, these are basically all online. Orc ID has perhaps become the default, um, I guess, research uh, profile, which links into most journals and most research databases now, the open researcher and contributor identifier. If you don't have an Orc ID, then, then I encourage you to sign up. WordPress. Um, as more of the portfolio, ResearchGate is a research social network and academia.edu. Uh, LinkedIn is getting a lot more popular now as well for, for sharing that. So I hope that kind of answers uh, Marion's uh, questions to some extent about what is this CMOOC and what are we doing? Um, so there was a sign up page and we've, we've kind of had a couple of different ways of getting there because um, with University of Melbourne, we had their own sign-up page there. Um, so there may be some details that you haven't supplied, which would be useful for, for me to be able to link you into the rest of the community if you haven't gone through this page yet. Uh, one being the blog address, um, that we can curate those together and, and use RSS to be able to follow each other and you know, comment on each other's postings, etc. cetera, uh, and Twitter, Usernames as well. Um, if you signed up for the University of Melbourne, you've probably only supplied your email address so far. Um, so, what are we doing? Well, each of the weeks is basically seven weeks. When I did this first, um, actually designed this around 24 weeks. And you're all probably going, Well, I'm glad I didn't do that one. Um, but yeah, 24 weeks was a little bit too much. And uh, we quickly found that the sweet spot was around the seven weeks. And that's kind of what the research around MOOC says, is that uh, people's you know, attention span on an online forum is around about seven weeks and anything beyond that is just like, okay, I've had enough. Um, and it just so happens that maps perfectly with each of the core elements of the CMOP portfolio. So each of the seven weeks, we'll be exploring one of these core areas. If you click on one of these, it gives you an outline. Uh, it gives you some suggested uh, activities that you can get involved in. The idea of these activities is that you're creating um, some evidence as you're getting involved in these. Uh, you're becoming part of this community. You're sharing your experience. Um, so that's kind of the idea. So you're not going to find a whole lot of content here, but hopefully each week people will talk about um, maybe some Literature, literature and research, uh, research etc that they have used for their own um, their own experience so each of which we're going to follow through this as a bit of a format just to give it a structure uh, we have a project bank so if I just skip over to that here we go got it already loaded um, if you look down the bottom, this is, uh, we've stolen this from, well, borrowed from um, 
uh, DS106, the what they called their assignment bank, which is um, uh, Alan Levine, uh, who's who's been running uh, an online course for many many years now, and he created this custom template for WordPress for his participants as students to be able to share their work um, each week, and we've just basically customised this as a way of sharing examples of each of the sections of a CMOP portfolio. So you can see in the first part here, these are contextual statements. You can see as we go down the various sections, they kind of get fewer and fewer. So we're after a few more examples of, of the last few weeks. Um, you know, just sort of follows through on people's attention span, I suppose. Uh, but you can see 18 examples so far of contextual statements. Most of these are, you know, the pre-release sort of work in progress uh, ideas. Um, you can see some of the people that are online here with us here. We've got uh, Neil's contextual statement. And if we click into one of these, you can see a bit more of the details about it. Effectively, what these are, are a description and a link. So this is a link to Neil's WordPress blog, his portfolio, where he's been creating his CMOP portfolio and outlines his contextual statement. You can put custom images into this. Um, if you don't, then you just end up with our default um, icon. Uh, so what you're sharing here in this project bank is basically a link to elements of your portfolio as you're building it. I hope that kind of makes uh, sense. So each week and just encourage people as they're creating perhaps their contextual statements, uh, starting to think around operational issues, etc. Um, yeah, share share what your your outline of what you've done so far, or if it's you've already done it uh, and you want to get some feedback on it, share it here in the project bank. Um, we've got a few resources, so it links to the alt and the Ascolite pages. So. ALT is the Association for Learning Technology in the UK, and that's the professional society of uh, effectively educational technologists that's been running for 25 plus years in the United Kingdom. And uh, it was ALT that uh, created the CMOT uh, accreditation framework, and it's mapped against the UK professional standards uh, framework, which came out of the Daring Report of the late 90s. Um, it's the same standard, professional standards framework that uh, HEA, Advanced HE uh, is, is mapped to as well. Uh, the key difference being that uh, CMALT um, really focuses on the integration of learning technology into your portfolio, uh, whereas for Advanced HE, it's just one of uh, many other elements that they, they, uh, they focus on. So the CMOLT, it's really trying to explore uh, how you've integrated learning technology into your practice, into your process, into your thinking in, in a critical way and providing evidence of that. So I've got a link there to CMOLT Aust Australasia, which uh, is the Ascolite, um, I guess, franchise version of it. So uh, Ascolite is the Australasian Society for Computers and Learning and Tertiary Education. Huge mouthful, uh, <clears throat> which is effectively the southern hemisphere version of Alt. So um, covers um, Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia, and New Zealand are probably the key groups uh, involved in that, but pretty much anywhere in Australasia. So um, uh, Ascolite uh, supports CMOD accreditation, and uh, you can um, either be a member of ALT or a member of Ascolite to, to go through the accreditation process. So that, that is a key, uh, and perhaps one of the key differences with Advanced AG uh, is that you do need to be a member of either ALT or Ascolite to uh, apply for, for CMOD accreditation and to continue with it, to keep it. Um, and I guess that's Part of the key focus of CMOLT is, is really trying to um, have an active community around um, education, educational technology. 
And so every three years, you need to update your portfolio to keep it. Um, whereas in comparison, uh, for example, Advanced HE, you, it's one off once uh, for life. Uh, for CMOLT, you, you do need to update every three years. <clears throat> and I guess you might ask why? Well, I guess it kind of makes sense to me because education is just changing so rapidly. Uh, you could be highly relevant in 1985 with an overhead projector, but that's not going to get you very far today, um, for example. Uh, so there's some resources there. This also has a list of Australasian CMOLT holders. So on the, uh, the alt site, the UK site, there's a whole database of uh, predominantly people from the UK. Uh, but here you can see the specific to Australasia, the people who've um, so far got uh, CMOLT accreditation and when they did. As you can see, it's not a huge group yet. So um, you have the opportunity to, uh, I guess, you know, have, have a significant point of difference by uh, getting uh, CMOLT accreditation. There's also links to the alt site. So these are all linked off the resources page from the CMOLT CMOOC. Um, this is the official alt page for CMOLT. <clears throat> They've got a lot of resources there, guidelines. Um, you can see the, um, the criteria for the assessors, et cetera, links to various um, examples of portfolios, et cetera. And how does it map to perhaps other frameworks? There's a, there's a mapping table there as well. So a lot of good resources there on the alt site. I've also linked um, in the week one post to the CMOLT guidelines. This is a embedded PDF. And this is probably a good place to start. Have a bit of a flick, read through this, have a flick through this. What's, what's it all about? Um, what does it involve? Uh, it has some examples of different formats for portfolios. So you don't have to just think about WordPress. Uh, could be pretty much anything really. And in fact, it could be a Word document, although I wouldn't highly recommend that as a showcase for your ed educational technology um, expertise, but nevertheless, that's an option. So when you're thinking about uh, putting together your portfolios, there's basically three areas that are key. Each of the sections of your portfolio and running right through your portfolio it's not just a description, but you do need to describe what you're talking about in that section. What is it that you're talking about? What is your experience? Um, you know, really make it clear what you're talking about. But the key really is the reflection. Uh, what did you learn from that experience? And also, what's the evidence that you, sh you actually did do that? And what's the evidence of your particip participation in, in that uh, particular activity? So those are the three key elements of each section of a, of a CMOLT portfolio. A description, reflection, and evidence. And it might even be useful as a way of structuring each of your sections as well by breaking them down into um, those sort of subheadings. So we'll talk about this more as we go along. Um, but here's basically the different elements of a CMOLT portfolio. And today we're really focusing on the contextual statement, the first part. So other parts of, of the, our ecology of resources for this community, um, we have our Moodle discussion forum. So you would have been hopefully sent an email link to this. Uh, if not, you can go to community.sotel.nz and uh, you can request access uh, if, if the uh, email has maybe been blocked by your email service, um, it's possible that it has. <clears throat> so this is a discussion forum. This once again, it's linked off uh, the, the uh, main site. If we go into week one here, uh, you can see and the first activity there is to join the community forum if you haven't already. Um, I would have sent you an email <clears throat> and uh, you just need to confirm your email 
and then you'll get access to that uh, discussion forum. So you can see a few other links here as well. Um, there is a, a Twitter search using the hashtag. There's a link to the project bank. There's a link to our uh, collaborative map. Uh, there's a link to Tags Explorer, which is uh, a Twitter analysis tool. So in the forum, really it's a way of sharing. Um, as you can see, most of the sharing is, has been done by me. So I'd encourage you know, people to get in there and ask questions, share examples, etc. cetera. Um, but at the moment, it's kind of being used mainly as a, as a reminder for each week, um, which is why I'm keen to explore the uh, WordPress P2 and see if we get a bit more activity and sharing around that. So you would have had an invite to cmworkteam.wordpress.com, which is WordPress's uh, P2. It's kind of like their version of Microsoft Teams. Um, but hopefully we generate a bit more discussion there. So once you've accepted your invite, you become an editor in that site. So you can post, you can share, you can upload documents. Um, it's a little bit Spartan so far as to what you can actually do. But if you have a look under documents, uh, you can share documents a bit like Microsoft Teams as well. And here's once again, a link to that PDF for the CMOOC, uh, for the CMOP guidelines. We have been running the CMOOC in various iterations for a, a number of years now, since 2017. So you can see we've built up a fair um, bit of discussion, particularly on Twitter, for those people that have used Twitter. Uh, down the bottom here, this is Tags Explorer. Uh, you can see there's 211 nodes, which is effectively uh, participants, and uh, 1,204 edges, which is 1,204 uh, conversations that have that have uh, been going on and you can click on various nodes here and explore them a bit more it's just going a bit slow because uh, there's lots of items there now uh, and um, see what some of the activity is via twitter this is the collaborative map which um, hopefully you would have got an email to uh, unless you've signed up with an email address which uh, is not your Google login, uh, and there are a few of you who have who've done that, so I couldn't give you edit access because you need to have an email address that hooks you into your Google account to be able to become editors of this map. So this map is public, but I've set it so only invited people can collaborate. Because um, we don't want it getting spammed and, and uh, et cetera. So if I just update it, uh, you can see my uh, point of interest here on the map, which is obviously in New Zealand. And uh, you can edit these. You can put links to various profiles. I've put uh, my ResearchGate ORC ID, my Melbourne uh, MCSHE link, etc. You can uh, share photos, etc and also YouTube videos. So I've just got a couple of examples there on my profile, but just gives us a little bit of context and a bit of a feeling of the wider community. You can see there's quite a few people uh, around the other side of the world there as well. And give a bit of a face to our participants. So you can see the uh, latest people to put themselves on the map. We've got uh, Michael there. I'll pick on Michael because I know Michael. Um, you can add, add a photo, add a video, add a bit more info there, Michael. That'd be cool. So that's the map. Um, if you do need to share a different email address to me to give you edit access, then just email it to me, send it to me, and I'll add you via um, the right email address so you can edit this, this map. A quick question while you've got a bit of a uh, break in conversation there, Tom. Yeah. Um, just a question that's come through. Outside of the weekly Zoom session, roughly what commitment of time per week is required? So I was just giving an eye on the chat for you. 
Yeah, well, I guess really there is no requirement because uh, you know we're not going to be assessing you on on any of this. So the requirement is really up to you. How much effort do you want to put in? Um, and I guess because the key thing is it's about connecting people and it being a community and sharing, uh, then the more effort you put in, the more you're going to get out of it. Um, I guess as, a, as, a, as an idea, I would think, you know, the activities that, that we suggest each week, which are just a, like a triggering, you know, starting point of sharing, um, I would expect that would take maybe half an hour to an hour um, to, to work through. Um, anything beyond that, that's, that's really up to you. And, uh, you know, um, I think the people that do get the most out of it are the ones, obviously, who, who share the most. So um, it's, it's, yeah, it's up, up to people how much they want to engage with this as a community. Thanks for that. Good question. Sorry, I was just keeping an eye on the chat because I didn't know whether you were keeping an eye on that. <laughs> no, I kind of, uh, it's just on my periphery. Cause yeah, that's all right. It's all good. So. All good. I can, yep. I can see there's a few things popping up there, but uh, so uh, let's just go back to week one and um, back on the WordPress site, cmalt, cmalt.wordpress.com. Um, so effectively this week is a welcome. It's a bit of a setup week. So there's a, there's a few suggested activities to work through, um, you know, just because just to get, uh, communication setup is going to take a little bit of effort. So probably this week is probably the most intense week as far as how much time is it going to take you to, to do stuff. Um, <clears throat> so basically get involved in the community forum uh, or the, the new P2 site. Uh, I'll be putting the link to that uh, here as well, probably later on today. It's a work in progress. Um, if you're on Twitter, then share some uh, links, ideas, resources, etc., via the hashtag CMOLTSEMWIC. Do a bit of a welcome, you know. Hi, Chris, good to have you on board, etc., etc. You know, use, use Twitter to be able to do that. Uh, and particularly perhaps those who are, who are uh, remote, you know, the people that are in, in the UK who are probably all currently in bed. Uh, be a great way to connect with them. Uh, set up your portfolio. We do su suggest WordPress. I think it's a, it's a great platform. It's very customizable. It's not necessarily the most intuitive to set up to start with. So it does involve a bit of, bit of work. There's lots and lots of resources around though for how to set up a, a WordPress site. Um, YouTube, lynda.com or LinkedIn Learning as it is now. Uh, and WordPress itself has lots of tutorials. Or if you just um, you know post uh, particular questions or issues that you have to the discussion forums or Twitter, I'm sure someone from the community will will give you some feedback or ideas on how to do stuff. I've put a link to a survey. Uh, this is just a short ten question survey. It's just to get a bit of an idea of where people are at, where they're from. Uh, I'm using SurveyMonkey, and uh, so far we have seven people have done that. So at the end of the week, once a few people have done that, um, I'll share the results um, and uh, we might have a brief look at that in our catch up next week. Uh, what else? Um, suggesting people set up some of their online e-portfolios if they haven't done already, uh, if, you have, if you haven't created a ResearchGate profile. Um, I think it's a, it's a really useful way of sharing your research um, and academia.edu, uh, I'm not quite so excited about academia.edu. They tend to sort of spam your email a bit more. Um, the key with any online research social network like those, and including Mendeley, is uh, thinking about the copyright and what you're sharing. So if you're sharing access to journal articles, um, make sure that you, you're uh, in agreement with whatever the uh, copyright is for the journal article that you're sharing. Um, is it publicly available or not? Uh, if not, most journals allow you to share privately uh, like a pre-publication copy and you can do that via researchgate and academia.edu. Um, if it's an open access uh, journal, an article, then, um, then you can probably quite happily share the, the, uh, the final uh, open access version via these platforms. 
LinkedIn and Orc ID as well. Google Scholar um, <clears throat> is probably the most comprehensive research profile. Uh, it's just not the most, um, uh, given the most kudos at this stage. Um, I haven't put a link there because every country has their own version of Google Scholar. So apart from that, we, each week we'll uh, aim to catch up, have a discussion, a webinar, which is what we're doing right now, and then move on to that part of the portfolio. So this week is the contextual statement, which really is about what is behind why you're involved in educational technology. Um, you know, what, what are some of the drivers? What's some of your background? Uh, what's some of the influences? And it could be, you know, um, not just theory and literature, but, uh, you know, what, what brought you into this field? Maybe it was a bit of a tangential, uh, you know, move from something else. Or um, I guess for me, some, some of the key influences for me in getting involved in educational technology was my, my father, who was a school teacher and a school principal and, you know, uh, bought one of the first calculators, analog uh, you know, calculators back in the 70s. And, you know, I helped him with uh, preparing his notes and stuff like that. And so that was a huge influence on me and my practice. Um, so the contextual statement is basically, you know, putting your flag in the ground and saying who you are and why you're interested in CMOT uh, accreditation. What are some of the key influences? Uh, and uh, you can link into supporting literature and theory. What I do tend to find is people get quite excited about the first part of their portfolio and perhaps in, end up even dumping effectively what should be in the rest of their portfolio into their contextual statement, um, whereas the contextual statement should be just a bit of a summary, a bit of a, you know, a, a, where you're heading rest, with the rest of your portfolio. Um, if you do look at mine, it's probably not the best example because it's, I, I kind of did that. I kind of dumped everything into my contextual statement and then started linking out as I moved through, through it later. Um, <clears throat> so I guess it's because it's the first part of your portfolio, you, you do tend to go in there fresh and keen, um, but just sort of realize that perhaps a lot of the stuff you might put into the contextual statement might be better off in some of the other sections as evidence and reflection, but signpost that in your contextual statement. I hope that's kind of making sense. So have a look at some of those examples in the project bank. Um, if you're feeling like you'd like to share where you're at with your contextual statement, perhaps later on in the week, then uh, post that into the project bank and uh, you know, post it on the discussion forum, et cetera, see if you can get some feedback on it and um, maybe some comments. Uh, embedded the CMOP guidelines there. Um, it's a couple of links to some of, some slightly older versions of CMOP portfolios from the UK in this case using Google Sites. And for those of us who uh, you know are been on a bit of a journey on, on doing the CMOP portfolio, this is really quite a nice little blog post around um, the number of years that it took um, to, to actually uh, get around to finishing the CMOP portfolio. So don't feel that you're on your own if, you, if you've done this once or twice before and you haven't quite completed because most people do take a fair while um, to pull it all together, to get it into a format that really makes a, a, a story that fits together. Because for a lot of people that got, you know, like, like myself, you've got lots and lots of evidence, but how do you pull that into a systematic portfolio that actually makes a consistent uh, uh, story and, you know, actually provides key evidence of what you've done rather than a whole lot of random bits. So uh, just kind of think through that. So at that stage, I've probably done more than enough talking. I'm gonna stop screen sharing and, and I'm sure everyone's got lots of questions, so fire away. Um, Thomas, Julie here. Just a quick question. I'm looking at the UK site. Certified Membership CMOLT support. What is the difference for new candidates between the CMOLT guidelines and the senior MOLT, CMOLT guidelines? Good what question. So uh, there are now three levels of CMOLT. 
So if you're familiar with Advance HE or HA Fellowship, as it used to be called, they have four, four levels. Um, so CMOD only had one. <clears throat> uh, and over the last two years, uh, they've developed um, three levels of CMOD accreditation. Um, two reasons. One, to make it easier for people to get on board. Uh, so there's an associate CMOD for people with less experience or perhaps um, for an academic who uh, does engage with educational technology, but not to the sort of level that perhaps an educational technologist might, whose, whose job is, is all about educational technology, but still wants to get credit for using educational technology in their practice. Uh, and then there's a higher level senior CMOP now introduced if you've got a significant body of evidence around um, you know, leadership, in educational technology um, or, or a significant body of evidence around research in educational technology. So I guess it's kind of like uh, target where you're at and uh, you could even use it as a bit of a process. Uh, if you don't have a huge amount of evidence at this stage, you could go for associate CMOP. Um, once you've built that up over, over three years and you come to the point where you need to update your portfolio, well then you might as well go for standard CMOP and, uh, and meet that criteria, which just adds a couple more elements of, of evidence and description and reflection. Uh, and then, you know, once you've got significant body of the evidence, you could go for a senior CMOP. So a really good question, Julie. And uh, just to give you an idea of numbers, well, there's currently, uh, I think about 550 CMOP hold holders globally. Uh, and there's about uh, five or six senior CMOP holders globally. Not, not a whole lot of associates yet because that's pretty new too. Clear. Uh, a quick question. I've got um, an associate fellowship um, with a, no, they forgot, they keep changing their names, don't they? But HEA, I've got my fellowship. Yes. But I didn't go for a full fellowship because I'm a learning designer and I, I found a bit of a fraud going trying to go for full fellowship because I don't technically teach. I provide support to academics. So I do training, so it's type of teaching. And so I'm feeling similarly, should I be going for the associate CMOLT or, or a standard CMOLT? Because technically I don't, I'm not an academic. I don't teach in front of students. I'm more of a support person. But does yeah. that mean I should be going associate rather than no, full No, because uh, that is one of the differences with CMOT accreditation compared to uh, advanced HE is that I guess the target audience has been educational technologists uh, and predominantly they tend to be in support roles and not necessarily um, you know, academics uh, teaching full time. They tend to be collaborating with and support uh, for um, Preach academics. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, that, that has been the traditional target market for a CMOT. Um, and if you have, you know, significant evidence of that, that, that work, then that will get you CMOT uh, accreditation. Um, the, the key is um, linking this back to obviously to, to learning theory, to why have you uh, um, done what you've done? Uh, rather than a focus on the technology, it's on, it's, it's on the technology enabling learning. And so think about uh, how you've integrated technology into assessment design. Um, why have you used the LMS uh, in a discussion forum, et cetera. Think about the why behind those things, not, not just the, the nuts and bolts of, of the technology. That's, that's not gonna get your accreditation. Um, so, you know, providing evidence of, of having collaborated with academics, how you've perhaps guided them in developing their online courses, their, you know, and in the time of COVID-19, there's going to be lots and lots of, of evidence of that. Uh, but it's coming back to the why behind. Um, why have you, uh, you know, suggested or, or helped them create the, a, a certain assessment approach online, etc.? I think that's where I'm coming from too, Claire. Um, 
I'm a trainer um, and I look after the LMS at AUT, um, but also I had to find out the why are people using this technology and you know how are the students reacting to it, what's the learning theory behind it. So that's I think that's where I'm coming from as well. And I think also just being really explicit about what your contribution is when you're collaborating with other people. What what is it that you brought to that partnership? Um, don't don't just talk about or describe um, you know an, the development of an online course. Uh, talk about what was your part in that process. Be really sp specific about it. Um, you know how much guidance were you providing? How much uh, in, um, input into the actual design of assessment criteria and rubrics and um, etc. You know. And from a, you know, even though the, the core target market, I suppose, for CMOLT accreditation has been an educational technologist, there's no reason why an academic with uh, experience of integrating technology into their teaching practice uh, can't get CMOLT. Um, and, and I guess that's partly what we're trying to be, do, been doing is try to um, you know, break that mold of this is only for, you know, nerds and educational technologists. Well, it's not. Can, can I ask uh, a question, speaking as a nerd, but not as an educational <laughs> technologist? Um, yes. And um, I'm, I'm interested in sort of the difference between a senior and, and a standard, um, because one of the criteria I see is that you're in a particular role, and I'm wondering to what degree is that flexible? In other words, to what degree is it about what you've actually done versus uh, what the label may be. Um, because I've interacted a bit with advanced higher education in a previous, in a previous position. And sometimes the, it, got a little, it got a little sticky between those areas. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can you know, understand what you're saying. So maybe you're a senior lecturer, but you're actually, your impact is much wider than, than, well, than senior lecturer, yeah. you know? I have, I have hmm. about, 10 years of publishing in the field and, you know, I've got a few publications that have some pretty heavy citations uh, that are specific to educational technology within higher education. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm kind of thinking it through and I was like, well, I think I, I could make a case for senior, but I'm kind of not fitting that mold that you just mentioned, which is, you know, I'm not a learning technologist. No, but once again, you don't have to. And I, th I think that's the, um, <clears throat> that's partly the reason why um, there's, there's such a limited number still. There's, there's a bit of a misconception around what is it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, also, it's also because it's only one of the activities of Ascolite and Alt as a society. And when you go to their web pages, it's, you know, it's kind of tucked away um, because it's a society that's paid for by, by um, members' fees. Uh, everyone's doing this work for free. Um, so in comparison to something like H, uh, Advanced HAA, which is a huge organization with you know, lots and lots of money behind right. it, right. Yeah, that's the sole focus of what they do. Um, you know, it's a very different proposition. But yeah, coming back to what you're talking about, Chris, um, yeah, there's no reason why you couldn't go for senior. The, the key there is, is providing evidence and reflection on impact. Yeah. What, what is your contribution? Uh, how has it impacted and been leading in the field uh, yeah. and impact beyond your own institution or your own department to, you know, say, say across the, the entire university or <coughs> nationally or internationally? Uh, and yeah. it's providing evidence and, and reflection around that. Okay, great. Thank you. And, uh, you know, as I said, there's... Um, I think there's a couple of seniors currently in um, uh, accreditation process, but there's still only five or six um, globally. So if you want to stick a feather in your cap, it's a good way to go, I think. <laughs> Are there any other questions? We've kind of just gone past an hour. I don't want to keep people just, you know, keep people online because yeah, 
Um, just a final question, Thomas. Um, will this meeting be at the same time each week now? So I can block out my calendar? Yeah, that's, um, there should be a calendar event that uh, hopefully you were sent, but yes, the same time. There will probably be an issue, um, I think in two weeks time, because New Zealand goes to daylight saving an hour, sorry, a week before uh, Australia does. And I think it's uh, a week before the UK flicks as well. So oh, that, that's why there's a, an hour earlier in two weeks' time. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll, we'll that's, adjust. That's, that's what the calendar's showing up as, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll adjust the time so it's not, you know, um, 8.30 for Australia. So we'll keep it the 9.30 for Australia and we'll go to 12.30 in New Zealand for that week. Um, but yeah, it, unfortunately, daylight saving does make that slightly confusing for a week. Okay, well, great to meet everyone and uh, looking forward to getting to know you a bit more. Looking forward to seeing Tom. some of your work and sharing. And I've been yes, there's a question, yeah. yeah. The, the, the calendar invite that has been sent, um, I can't seem to, I can seem to which is one problem or what the problem is so just yeah just to let you know Tom. sorry I, I couldn't i couldn't hear that marion my connection broke up a bit there's some issues with it i couldn't open it and that put it in and you know deleted it and um, but yeah, and somebody else, I think Samantha said she had issues as well. Just to note, Marina, I had that problem when I tried to open the individual. If I opened it as a group, there was no problems. Right. Okay. Well, yeah, just to let, yeah. And, um, okay. and the other thing that I was wanting to find out, what do we need to do now in anticipation for next week? So have a look on the cmook.wordpress CMO, site and the latest post is week one. So if you work your way through that uh, post there, there's several activities uh, that are bullet pointed there that I'd like you to work through. Thank you. Okay, and as far as next week goes, if you wanna look ahead, um, you, if you look at activities in week two, there's an outline of, of where we're heading for week two as well. Awesome, okay, thank you everyone. We'll catch you all later. Thank you so much. Okay, bye. Thank you, bye-bye.